I would like first to make it as informal as possible. I could give a nice lecture, etc., but I'd rather have you engage. A question will ask. I might know the answer, I might not, but it's your talk more than it is mine. There's some collages around. I gave a little half tour a little bit before some of the little things, some of the questions. Free free to look towards the end, etc. We can go a few ways with this, but go a nice way that we tested out before, a little bit different, and then we'll go with the uh, little thing. So, first of all, I'd like to dedicate this talk to my Uncle Freddie, my Uncle John, my family, friends, Belmont and the Bronx, and old Yankee Stadium. The old Yankee Stadium would have been 100 years old this week. Let us go back to yesteryear for the greatest moments in sports. A hundred years of the greatest sports moments in the Bronx, old Yankee Stadium. The house that Root built. That's a little nickname, Bronxism, house that Root built <coughs> Yankee Stadium. Now, a little question. And that will proceed into a whole section of things. The little question will come. Each Bronx tale of Yankee Stadium past can be a chapter, if not a book. The Bronx tale needs to be told. 100 years Yankee Stadium. Okay. Now, I will start with a little question. What number did Babe Ruth wear? Three. Three. Number three. Famous number three. So, instead of going with the 20 greatest sports events first, or the poem of Yankee Stadium on the 75th birthday, which was given to Yankee Stadium and 20, 30 other people who worked or whatever were involved with Yankee Stadium in 1998, I'm going to go with a thing called a trilogy, which means three. And with that trilogy, I will try to show some of the great sports events, and then we can go one, two, three, four, to 20. The greatest sports moment in Brown sports history. We'll do number one first. Uh, I could give you the dates, but we'll just say the year is 1938. Joe Lewis, Max Schmeling fight, two. It's, I consider it, and a lot of other sports writers consider it, the greatest sporting event of all time took place in Yankee Stadium. The referee, Arthur Donovan Sr., who lived up on the concourse. Lewis versus Schmeling too. The world was at verge of war. The Nazis had their idol, Max Schmeling, who had defeated Joe Lewis two years earlier. First loss for Joe Lewis at Yankee Stadium. Now there's a rematch. The world, the United States, the little people on the farms, Everybody was behind Joe Lewis because this was a prognosticator for the world war that was to emerge, World War II. So it wasn't just a local event, a national event, it was a global event. And we'll see another little boxing global event a little bit later. Okay, so the greatest sports month, number one. Number two. October 8, 1956, Yankee Stadium. Don Lawson pitches a perfect game at Yankee Stadium in the World Series. A perfect game doesn't happen too frequently, and the rarity of it happening in a World Series, the numbers go off the chart. Number three, 
just take a minute because if I have to select one that I like, I would select number three because I was involved with this December 28, 1958, the greatest game ever played the NFL. I put a little t-shirt, I wrote about it, made collages about it, working on a few projects, and if you go to the NFL Hall of Fame, Canton, Ohio, you will find the work under Professor Mastro. December 28, 1958. And that famous picture, which we don't have a big version, we have small versions. That famous picture, which is supposedly the most famous event in NFL history and the most famous picture of NFL history. I am in that picture. I was in the right field bleachers where the diagonal railing met with the horizontal railing. I was right there with my Uncle Freddie. We were watching the game. My other uncles were at the game also, but that's another tale to be told. Uh, okay. So the next trilogy we're going to look at is Perfect Games. Don Lawson, 56, number one. Number two, David Wells in 1998, May 17, 1998. And number three was Dave Cohn, 1999. Now, in 1999, Perfect Game by Dave Cohn, New York Yankees. It was also Yogi Berra Day. Yogi Berra was the catcher who caught the Perfect Game off of Don Lawson. And also in the stadium was Don Lawson, the picture of, of the first Perfect Game for the Dave Cohn. The next trilogy is Homer's. Not Homer Simpson, but Homer's in baseball, yes? Okay. The first Homer hit in Yankee Stadium, April 18, 1923, Babe Ruth, opening day. Uh, opening day at Yankee Stadium. Okay. In 1927, Babe Ruth hit 60 home runs. Number 60 at Yankee Stadium. And in the magical year 1961, Roger Maris, New York Yankees, hit number 61 in 1961 at Yankee Stadium. World Series homers. We are pretty much familiar with Reggie Jackson, October 18, 1977. Not one, nor two. But three homers at Yankee Stadium. Yes? But little do people know that Babe Ruth did this twice. Only he did it at other stadiums. So it hurt me that Yankee Stadium couldn't be included with that because I would have liked it. Uh, boxing, we'll just go three. Number one was the say, uh, the Lewis Schmeling fight, 1938. The world was watching. Uh, number two was the last fight in Yankee Stadium, Ali versus Norton in 1976, boxing. And number three, I'm putting in another little event because I got good response from it. March 8, 1971, the fight of the century, Muhammad Ali versus Joe Fraser in Madison Square Garden. Hey, you're supposed to be talking about Yankee Stadium. What's Madison Square Garden have to do with it? Well, I bent the rules a little bit because the referee, who happened to be a personal friend of mine, Arthur McCanty Sr. was the referee for this great global heavyweight boxing match. So I included it as number two. I hope you can forgive me that I didn't include Yankee Stadium. I could have put a few others in, but they were, they were pulling at trivia and things like that. Okay, which, number six, the trilogy. I call it my NFL 1958 trilogy. 
the Giants were trying to get to first place. In their way was Cleveland, Cleveland Browns. December 14th, 1958, the last game of the season, Giants versus Cleveland, and it's being played at Yankee Stadium. Okay. Basically, the Giants had to win. If they tied, Cleveland would have went to the championship. So, in the closing seconds, with snow on the ground and the skies dark, Pat Summerall kicks a field goal, 50 yards. The Giants win. Some people consider that the greatest kick of the NFL. And John Madden, who passed away a number of years, considered it the greatest NFL kick of all time. Because besides winning the game, that kick brought the Giants to the next step and then the next step, which we'll soon see. December 14th, December 21st, 1958. The Giants now have a playoff game against the Cleveland Browns. Some people, many football people, consider it the greatest defensive game of all time. The great runner Jim Brown might have had a little less than 10 yards rushing. And the Giants shut out the Cleveland Browns for the playoff, 10 nothing. So we have two games at the same place with the two teams playing each other. Now we call number three. December 28, 1958. The greatest game ever played, first Southern death overtime at Yankee Stadium. Baltimore Colts 23, New York Giants 17. I had the program for that game in my hand. When we took the bus to get home, I ripped up the program. I was so disgusted, so broken hearted. And it's sad to say, I'm still broken hearted from that day in 1958. Giants should have won, but that's another story. My next trilogy is called NFL Championships, 1956. The Giants play their first NFL championship at Yankee Stadium. They beat the Bears, Chicago Bears, 47-7. to The Giants wore sneakers. Very cold that day. I wasn't at that game, but my Uncle John, God bless his soul, he was at that game and he told me he was sitting on the Chicago Bear bench with the players. Okay. Second game. The 1958 greatest game ever played. Championship. Number three of the trilogy. 1962. The greatest team of NFL history, the Green Bay Packers of 62, some people say yes, some people say no, played the Giants. It was very cold that day, it was horribly cold. Some people consider it the coldest game with wind chill factor. And the Giants lost that part of the trilogy. It was the last NFL championship at Yankee Stadium. But, one of the great positives that came out of that game, NFL Films was born that day and it became part of the NFL. The 58 game united TV, American culture, and football, where the Super Bowl came many years later, a few years later. Okay. I have a trilogy of football's greatest games. Just take a minute or two, run this by. Number one, the 58 NFL championship again. Number two, in 1946, November 9th, Notre Dame and Army. Number one versus number two. Army was number one, Notre Dame was number two. Used to play their classic games at Yankee Stadium. The game ended 0-0, and it was called the game of the century. Yankee Stadium, Army, Navy, 0-0. Number three is a game that not too many people know about. At Yankee Stadium in 1947, in the other football league, the 
All-America Football Conference. The Giants played the Cleveland Browns. The Giants were winning 28-0. However, the Cleveland Browns came back, tied the score. The game ended 28-28, tied the greatest game of the All-American Football Conference. And a little side note to that, the commissioner of the AFC was uh, Jim Crowley, the great coach of Fordham uh, during the 30s and one of the four horsemen of Notre Dame. And the vice president of that league was the woman Eleanor Garrick, the wife of Lou Garrick, the great baseball star. Okay? Uh, football's greatest games. Now, with your permission, I have two little things that I like to do. I'm going to just, how would you say, take a few steps from Yankee Stadium. And I'm going to go to the Polo Grounds. But before I go to the Polo Grounds, I'm still at Yankee Stadium. NYU and Fordham during the 30s had tremendous football rivalry. And NYU was based where the Bronx Community Colleges now play their home games at Yankee Stadium. So, NYU in 1935, this is called the 35, the 36, the 37 trilogy, Fordham versus NYU, college football. 1935, NYU was heading towards the Rose Bowl. In those days, the Rose Bowl was like today's Super Bowl. And their rival was Fordham, the last game of the season, at Yankee Stadium. Fordham beat NYU. Bingo. No Rose Bowl for NYU. 1936, Fordham has a direct path to the Rose Bowl. Last game of the season is NYU. The game starts. NYU kicks off to Fordham. Fordham gets the ball, they bring it down the field. Touchdown! They go for the extra point. No good. Ball's kicked off. NYU gets the ball. They bring it down the field. And Lombardi told the story that he felt responsible because he made the sole tackle on this guy, George Severis, NYU, the running back. And he made the tackle, but the tackle ended up with a touchdown for NYU. NYU scores, tied, 6-6. Six, six. They kicked the extra point, 7-6. The rest of the game became a pumping game and a defensive game. And NYU smashed Fordham's Rose Bowl bid. 1936, seven blocks of granite, the famous seven blocks of granite team. Lombardi, on many occasions, that was his worst loss in football. A 36 NYU Fordham game at Yankee Stadium. 1937, they played at Yankee Stadium and Fordham got revenge. They beat NYU. So, with that, we have a little bit, but now I'm going to pull a joker out of the deck. I'm going to pull a little mathematics. First of all, when you play a sport, the odds of a tie are very rare. Okay, and in a trilogy, that means three games. So I'm going to try to provide to you something with a Bronx base. I couldn't get Yankee Stadium into it, so I got across the street, the Polo Grounds, across the river, the Polo Grounds. 1935, 36, 37, Fordham, Pittsburgh trilogy, college football. 1935, both teams were nationally ranked within the top 10, Fordham versus Pitt. They play at the Polo Grounds. First game, 1935, 0-0. Zero zero. It ended in a tie. Second year, 1936, Fordham plays Pitt again during the course of the year at the Polo Grounds. The game ends 0-0 zero zero tie. I'm not making this up. I read this because to make this up, 
I need to use a little math brain, a little football brain, a little interest of people. You know, like, you, no, no, you made this up. This, this can't be. 1937, Ford and Place pit again. Joker to the deck. Zero, zero tie. I'm not making this up. I'm just reading the football books at the polo ground. So that ends my trilogy of Yankee Stadium. And with that, some of the great events were. We'll take a little pause. Any questions so far? If what do we need to do? Where do we need to go? What would you like to do? Or if you want, we'll go around the collages. Whatever you want. Where exactly okay. Vivian. Yes, Vivian. Yeah. Where exactly were the polo ground? Yeah, I was going to ask that. 155th Street, 155th Street and 8th Avenue. After they tore down the polo grounds in the end of 57 going into 58, 155th and 8th, 8th Avenue. Okay. That's where the polo grounds were. Yeah. yeah, and there, there's little stories which we'll throw when you mention polo grounds. That was home for a lot of great baseball and a, a lot of great football, but then Yankee Stadium, how would you say, took the crown. But that's, you know. Okay, One of the heroes of the New York Giants who played in the polo grounds lived on the 3333 building up in Riverdale. I forget the name. White I call it the, the White Hall. Yeah, the three, three, three. It's got how many threes? <laughs> Four. <laughs> Four three. Okay. And we talked about three before. Look at that. My there we go. Three. three. <laughs> yeah, this is similar to three. Friend of mine My friend told me a story. He worked for Bell Telephone. He came in. He had to fix the telephone. His name was Willie Mays, New York Giants center fielder, San Francisco. And then New York Mets, Hall of Fame, Willie Mays. Supposedly, lots of times when they played baseball at the polo grounds, besides the greatest catch, September 29, 1954, Willie Mays. Okay, you also get that in a calculus class, but that's another story. Willie Mays used to play stickball in the streets with the little kids of Harlem when he was a star way back when, right by the polo grounds. Yeah, right. You know, I didn't see it, but I'm working on a little fictional story where my stickball team plays this Harlem team. And Willie Mays comes to play for them because we're beating them. And then they start beating us, and then we start beating them. And then he hits the ball in the last inning. And I'm running for it. And it's way over my head. And it hits a car, and it bounces up. Hits another car, bounces up. It's another call, and I catch it, and we win. <laughs> I'm making it up, though. Yeah. It didn't happen, but I'm going to make believe it did happen the day we beat Willie Mays. Because in my story, uh, I have a little story, but I'm not going to say it now. It's about sports. Uh, the day I beat Miles Davis, you heard of Miles Davis? In boxing. Okay, not music, in boxing. I didn't actually beat Miles that Davis, wasn't, that wasn't but... His forte. <laughs> huh? That wasn't his forte. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't actually beat him in boxing, but I had a good part in beating somebody of his in boxing. Good part. Yes. I have a question. Helen, Helen. yes? Uh, you, you were talking about the, uh, the giant football playing in that Yankee Stadium. I'm not a sports fan, so I don't know much about it, but I know they play in New Jersey. Now, when did they go to New Jersey? They went they, they, they went to the Bronx. They used to play at the Polo Grounds first. The Giants. The, Polo the Giants. Uh, 1926, Red Grange came for a year, two years. We brought the new league in, the league folded up. Uh, then in the late 40s, you had the AFC teams. Right up until 1950, 51, there were a few little teams playing in Yankee Stadium with a New York logo. New York uh, uh, Yanks, New York Yankees, etc. 56, they came to Yankee Stadium. They stayed till 73. Then they tore the stadium down. No more football after 73. The old Yankee Stadium. So they never played in the new stadium. The, the, old, the old Giants? Yeah. 
the Giant football never played in the New, New, New Yankee Stadium. Not yet. No, they had the Pinstripe Bowl, which incorporated. And the Giants went to Jersey, I think 76 was the year. Mm -hmm. And they stayed there a number of years. But the owners of the Giants, the two owners, Tish and Mara, both are from the Bronx. But don't they still play in New Jersey? Yeah, the Giants still play in New Jersey, yes. And the Jets play there too. Yeah, they things like that. All right. Anything else? Another question or two? Feel free, feel free. If you want, we'll talk about the collages. Whatever you want. Well, if you want, I'll go 20, 19, 18, the games. You want to talk? Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll just put this over here. Uh, too bad I should have brought a pointer. But if you can get up and look too, you know, you want to take pictures. Okay. So we'll just replay. Okay. We'll go with the first one that I made. This was the first one. And behind each collage is a story or a chapter. Uh, you know, this is the way things worked. 1981, I got the copyright for the poem. I'll just do the first stanza. The glory of the black and gold. In the fabled court of fall, many Rooney fans will recall when pigskin tales are told, the glory about the black and gold. As the story of the Pittsburgh Steelers and their Super Bowls, their four Super Bowls during the 70s. So basically I wrote this because the Steelers weren't going to win any more Super Bowls at that point, and I felt sorry for that. <laughs> I felt so So I wrote a little poem telling about their Super Bowl experience. So gone are the golden rings, the black towels, and other things. So here is the fable tale told, the glory that was, the black and gold. Okay. Now, what happens is that I decide to put the pictures to the poetry. So, Mean Joe Green, computed the steel in green, Lambert, lump, jumped the wing, Franco Harris, catch the ball, Palm did fit, wasn't it immaculate? Okay, so, I put the pictures to it, and I sent it to the NFL Hall of Fame, they published the poem first, then I sent them the little picture. 1983, when Canton, Ohio, the NFL Hall of Fame, was celebrating the Pittsburgh Steelers' 50th anniversary, they included this poem, because there was two versions. This is one that you could read, and the other one you could read also, but it's in medieval Gothic print to give it that fairy tale flavor. And they included this picture with the Steelers 50th anniversary in Canton, Ohio. Thank you. And I have here, I just need to locate it, but years later, uh, I gave this of course to the owner, he loved it, he sent me all sorts of things, you know, football related, George Rooney way back when, 1981, etc. Now, this is a hard picture, but it's a little funny to see. I'll pass it around. Okay. Look what's on my right hand. There's four rings. Right? Yes. Four rings. Let's see. You got a book? Oh, where is it now? We just had it. It was four rings, yeah. Oh, there we go. Four rings. The Steelers won four Super Bowls. And they're on my fingers. The guy with me, his name is Rocky Blotter. I gave him a copy of this. He loved it. He put four rings on my finger. Okay? And I told him, I says, Rocky, 
All due respect to you, and this is a true story because I have no intentions to fit. Okay, true story. I told Rocky Blau, I said, Rocky, if it was up to me, with no disrespect to you and the Steelers, you would be wearing two. He said, what do you mean? And I started to tell him my Dallas Cowboy story, which has been chronicled in NFL history and the NFL. It's a little story. But had I had my way, Rocky Blair would have two Super Bowl rings and I would have the other two. <laughs> okay? And he got a kick out of the butt. He was like a kid looking at this. I gave it to him. I said, this is for you. We talked. And then he walks off. I got four Super Bowl rings on my finger. Four. And I'm saying to myself, he's walking off. I can go Empire City. I can go. I get lost. I go to the bathroom, change my shirt. I got four Super Bowl rings. <laughs> So then I waited till he was like maybe a hundred feet away. Rocky! <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it was, a fun, it was a, a fun little thing. But in truth, I speak in truth. There's no need to fabricate. Okay, so that was the first one. Now I got to figure which was second because of the time. I would say it was the Bronx Sports. Yeah. I used to write for the Bronx sports papers, Bronx Times, Bronx News. I used to do a whole bunch of sports history. And I did over the years, years back, maybe before you were born. I don't want to know your age, but uh, for Max at the Bronx Net, I used to have football shows years ago. You know, maybe, uh, I, I would, I'm not going to guess your age, but it was way back. <laughs> okay? So, I did write sports. I have my work in the NFL. Fordham has some of my work. A few Hall of Fames have my work. Uh, the College Football Hall of Fame, I got a person elected to it. I'm trying to get into the NFL Hall of Fame. And I got the same person elected to the National Track Hall of Fame. But that's another story that I don't want to go off the course. True story. True, true that, true that, true that. Okay. Wrong sport. So I used to write about sports, so I decided to collage some of the Bronx sports. And like I showed Vivian and Helen, yes? There's a lady in the sports. She was from the Bronx. Her name was Gertrude Ellerly. She swam the English Channel faster than any man, 1926. Supposedly, some people told me they knew of how she lived on Stadium Avenue in Column Bay for a while. And then she was a school teacher, PS45, 189th Street, Laurel Rod Hoffman. And uh, Garfield, John Garfield also went to that high school. Oh no, that, that school. And John Garfield, I mentioned in the Bronx Sports Clause, because he did a few boxing films of Body and Soul, John Garfield. And there's a few other people went to PS45, and then you got nowadays the Belmont. I don't want to go down the Belmont Road because if we go Belmont sports, we go in another direction, and we never get out of here to a degree. So I put a little collage of things. There's all sorts of storylines. I can mention names. They might sound strange. Muhammad Ali. I have a picture with Muhammad Ali and my uncle, my uncle Charlie, were in 1962. It was a movie, Requiem for a Heavyweight. They used the boxers up in the Montcalm or CYO. My father knew all of them. My father might have been in the original cuts, etc. And then years later, there was another boxing film, Raging Bull. Jake Lamada, Raging Bull. My father was the one who instructed De Niro how to box for Raging Bull. True story. That's all. And there's a lot of Bronx history. All sports, basketball, football, baseball, college football, a little swimming, and a few odds and ends. A little collage. I put pictures. They say a picture's worth a thousand words. All right, now I got a time a time warp. Boom. Okay. Well, the photo one. Like I told Helen and Vivian. I approached Fordham's uh, 
sports department in early 1996. I want to write an article. And I want to write an article about the great 40 teams from 1929 to 1942. The golden rams of yesteryear. The seven blocks of granite. One and two. There was two groups. The seven. So, I'm playing around. I'm trying to get an idea to go. And I needed some inspiration. So, the coach of the great Fordham teams was Kavanaugh and Crowley. Crowley was one of the four horsemen of Notre Dame. And the four horsemen of Notre Dame all have Bronx connections, but the biggest one, the lead horseman, the best runner of the great Notre Dame backfield of the four horsemen of Notre Dame was Crowley. So, I thought about Crowley, I thought about Notre Dame, outlined against a blue October sky. So, etched forever upon the granite blocks of gridiron law stood the names in maroon and gold. Drews, Barbetsky, Lombardi, Wojciechowicz, Pierce, Franco and Pacman, perhaps the most famed line of all college law, the seven blocks of granite. Golden rams of yesteryear rekindled the fire, the hope, the courage, and the will to endure. Impassioned within our minds, our hearts, our spirit, the Fordham wall still stands tall, now and forever etched. To the seven blocks of granite. So I put this together. 1996. I did the poem first, and I did a whole like chronology of Fordham football history. They loved it. It was the program for the October 12, 1996 game against Lafayette. And said one of the Fordham players died on the practice field right before the game. And I was to do the broadcast of the game too. So at that point I left. I, you know, I was, I was really, you know, it was a very, very sad moment for the Bronx, for Fordham, for myself. So, after it was in the program, the, the writing of it, I decided to collage it. And I collaged it. I gave it to one of my close friends whose father knew Vince Lombardi. And then he showed me pictures where his father and Lombardi, they went to Europe together. They went places. And I said, well, oh my God. Then he gave me a book, which I still have, from Fordham football from the 30s and 40s. I got a scrapbook. He gave it to me. I said, why give it to me? He said, oh, oh. I gave him one of these. He loved it. Okay? The year is 2008 and they're making a monument for Fordham University. It's still standing and it's going to be standing for a while. The Seven Blocks Monument by Joe Molia. Okay? I was very responsible for that monument to be put up because I uh, had known Joe and we had met a few weeks earlier we were talking, and he says to me, what do you know about Fordham football? And I said, very little. And I, I, I told him, I showed him, and everything. So, uh, he told me, create a speech for me. I says, what for? He's doing the commencement. So, when they uh, christened the monuments, my speech was Joe's speech. And I felt so, so happy. Joe got a copy of this. Father McShane has a copy of this, and uh, Fordham University, Frank McLaughlin, and the athletic department have a copy of this. Now, I'm just going to go offshoot the Fordham collage, and this is true story because I have no intention to film it. I can give you the date too, but because it was a, a reunion, my high school reunion. Father McShane was in Tradinor restaurant. That's on Belmont, Tradinoi. That's a restaurant. And I had a video 
of Fordham football. I made a little flash drive slideshow. So, right before he's eating, I asked him for permission in a nice way. Father McShane, you remember me? Yeah, we talked, we know. I presented him the video of Fordham football history. For 10 minutes, a little short video showing the history of the great Fordham team. And he loved it. And I had no control over that. I parked my car, he parked behind me. I took care of the parking meter. Uh, hello, how are you? Hello, Father. And then they realized, hey, I got it in my bag. I presented it to him. And he gave the commencement speech and everything, etc., etc. And the monument still stands in Fordham. If you like football, if you like Fordham, if you want to go, you see a nice little monument. I had a little part in it. Yeah. And I'm happy I did. Okay? Because the guy that I mentioned also appears with a name in African American football. You might know the name. Ed, Ed, Ed Ram, Ed Robinson. Grambling? Okay. Ed All right. Because His name is Ed Robinson. <laughs> Ed, Ed Robinson. He was the coach of Grambling, Grambling University, good football team. And they used to have uh, classics in college football, Grambling and Morgan State, guess where? In the Yankee Stadium. And he became the greatest college African-American coach, Ed Robinson. My friend, this guy that I mentioned, won the Ed Robinson Coach of the Year Award a few years back. And I, I feel good because I was the captain on the team when he was on the team, in baseball and football. So I taught him football, and there he is. He's going to the Hall of Fame. You know, uh, he won the Coach of the Year. He's in the Italian-American Hall of Fame. But that's, that's it. So that's four of them. So far, pretty good. I'm telling the stories of each thing. I, I forgot my notes, but okay. Now I gotta think which came next. Okay, that that came before that. Okay. The year was 1998. But this actually uh, it was 1998. So I wrote a poem. That's right, the collage came later. I wrote a poem about Yankee Stadium sports. Since Yankee Stadium was gonna have a birthday, I tried to craft each ending word with birthday. Birthday, clay, play, today, Thanksgiving day, stay, USA, say, may, nay, etc. Rhyming each last word with birthday. Yankee Stadium's having a birthday. I wrote the poem. Then, a few years later, I decided to go with a different collage style than the others. I decided to go block fashion. Number three, Babe Ruth. So I put him first, there's Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth, the house that Babe Ruth built. And Babe Ruth mentioned here, Lou Gehrig mentioned here, Joe DiMaggio mentioned here. Some of the great sporting events of Yankee Stadium. Baseball, then a little football, baseball, football, baseball, boxing, football, baseball, football, baseball. Most of it is baseball. I put it together, they loved it. A few years later, or I'd say it around 2008, during when Yankee Stadium was going to, you know, uh, come, come tumbling down and things, I get a request. The Yankee organization wants 20 to 30 of these. So, so nice and easy. I get 20 to 30 of these, I drop them off Yankee Stadium, they give me all sorts of gifts. They pay me, they give me all sorts of gifts. And they gave me some tickets, beautiful tickets. They fed me that day too, which was nice. 
you know, I was treated like the guest of honor, and uh, the Yankees got it. And uh, I enjoyed doing it, and I put a little poetry, you know, maybe I like poetry as, as a youngster, play with the words, and I put the story together of the great events at Yankee Stadium, and then I decided to put the pictures. Yeah? When was old Yankee Stadium? When was old Yankee Stadium? It's a block across the street. Oh, really? Right here. That's where it was. And the new Yankee Stadium, McCombs Dam Park, had a little field there and things, and they, they moved it around. And the Yankee Stadium, according to the story of how they constructed it, they picked out a piece of land, and then somebody thought, there's this baseball player that looks pretty good. So they designed, supposedly, the right field for the left-handed hitter, Babe Root. So that way, instead of being whatever the measurements are, maybe it's 300 feet to right field, maybe it's 310. He's a left-handed hitter. It's easier for him to hit the homer. And the house that Root built or the house that home is built, whatever, you know, the Yankee Stadium, the old Yankee Stadium. Where did the Yankees play before 1923? Uh, they started, they, they played at the Polo Grounds most likely. I'm not too sure. Yeah. It was older. The Polo Grounds was older. Older, yeah. Polo Grounds. <laughs> yeah, if you haven't been to the Polo Grounds, it's, it's long and short at some spots. It's crazy, uh, yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, it's, uh, you know. It's the left Yeah. And. Yeah. Right. If you look at pictures, oh, okay. it's, uh, yeah. it's like wide places. It's like, <laughs> it's like, it's yeah. it's like it's not a good thing. But oh, wow. it had a left center that almost went 500 feet, which was the longest. Mm -hmm. And on that day, September 29th, 1954, Rick Wright's boom, power hitter, he blasts the ball to center field, left center field, and Willie Mays takes off. And he's running, and the ball is behind him. And he catches the ball like this. In other words, I don't know if he turned his head. He caps the ball like this. And he turns around and he throws a runner out or something. The greatest catch in baseball history. That shot was almost 500 feet. If the things were 100 feet closer, that would have been a home run. And most likely Cleveland would have won the World Series. Because a lot of people say, Mays made that catch, the whole Cleveland team collapsed. And the guy who won, or was the hero of that World Series, Dusty Road. He hit these little cheap 200-foot, 300-foot homers into right field. So Yankee Stadium, they had designs on this hitter, you know, for right field. As far as I, I don't know more about the Kishore, I just know a little bit. So I did the anger, and people liked it. I had given it as gifts. I did a few things, and... People like it, you know, I did a few radio shows, a few TV shows, you know, small TV around, things like that. Okay, now, let's see, let me see where we're at. Oh, my wife's favorite, okay? My wife knows very little bit about football. So, after I did the Yankee Stadium, I said to myself, you know what? I got all sports in Yankee Stadium. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to draw out the boxing, the little boxing that I have, and keep it in its poem. Uh, yeah, where's the Yankees? Well, they talk about Joe Lewis and everything. Uh, Yankees, Yankees, Buddy D, Players Day, the Mighty Babies Day, Max Radio, Newspaper. Well, oh, here it is. Great boxing matches all. Zale over Graziano, Marciano, Heat KO Sugar Ray, eh? Changed his name to Ali from Cassius Clay. Clay Sugar Ray. A little boxing section, a little poem. I did a baseball section, a little poem. I didn't update it after, you know, 98. Not yet, and I could update it, but I might not. It doesn't matter. Did you learn and, to write poetry in school? Huh? Did you learn to write poetry in school? I, I most likely did. I, I like poetry because 
uh, you could say something without reading 10 pages. Nice and short, to a degree. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed the, the poetry, and I still like poetry. I carry a little poetry it's book. Very nice. I hear yeah. And uh, I, wrote, I wrote some poems. I published a few poems over the years. And uh, uh, as a teenager, sometimes I'd go to the discotheques. This is during the, uh, uh, the 60s, Electric Circus. Uh, Chate Alexander, Maxim, some of the Bronx clubs were here. Yeah. And I get up and I do a little poetry skit. Nowadays, you know, I did a little poetry for fun. Everybody had a laugh. But I like the flow of poetry. Thank you for asking. You know, I like a lot of things. I like a little poetry. Reading is nice, but sometimes a thousand page book, if I can do one page a minute, that's a thousand minutes. <laughs> a thousand minutes is, uh, I don't know, 16 hours, 17 hours, if I do one page a minute. If not, <laughs> you know. And then I have books that I was supposed to read 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, they're still waiting. Right. I hope I get there. <laughs> so, you know, uh, my wife liked this one. So, I took out the football and I decided, Echoes of a football past Yankee Stadium yesterday. Upon these hollow grounds, our beloved heroes did play. And I go through all the football, I just draw it out of here, and I create the storyline. The Battle of the Bronx, NYU versus Florham, Thanksgiving Day. Notre Dame and Army on a Saturday. I still have the, the little AY yesterday, play, day, pray. Away, YA, YA, lay, play, way, say, nay, tray, whatever. <laughs> so, I did the poem, then I says, I like to collage it, but then I said, I gotta get all these football pictures, which I did presently on the flash drive. I took these words and I showed you a picture rather than a collage on this thing. So, I had some football stickers. And I started putting them in as a teams. 32 times 2 is 64. I had 64 things, two for each team. And guess what? They worked as a frame. So I showed my wife, oh, it's beautiful. She saw this. And I'm more interested in this. So I said, you know, and the Bronx County, uh, had, how would you say, uh, they did nice. They published this a few years ago in black and white. Just the poem, they didn't put the picture. And uh, people like it, oh, how nice, oh, how colorful. I, I, I had nothing to do with it. I just put the poem together that I got from this, the, the mother, the son, <laughs> Yankee Stadium. So I said, you know, why not? And she liked it. And uh, my friends, when we meet, you know, we get together reunions or friends, they, we have a good time. Or, all right, you know, you like it? Good. Take one. Take a copy. Take, oh, can I take a picture? Sure. Can I hang it up on my wall? Do whatever you want. <laughs> you know, I had fun doing it. My wife liked it, so I did check mark. That means I did the right thing, you know, she liked it, I must have done something right, because if she didn't like it, then I got to hear her, oh, you made that stupid picture, what are you doing, <laughs> who needs this, uh, you know, sometimes I have work that I don't think I even should bother putting together, because it's, it's stupid sometimes, it's funny, it's nonsensical, oh, that's stupid, what are you doing that, but if she says it's good, I take a step back, I says, you know, she says it's good. So maybe she's correct 50%. So if she's correct half the time, then I gotta look at it because I'll be correct at least 90% of the time. <laughs> so I take her word and I go from there. And I give my wife a lot of credit. She has to put up with me. I have to put up with myself too. <laughs> and the same thing I did here with football, I did with college mathematics. I'm not lying. I, 
could show you some of the things. I would take an example. India. Behold the mathematics of India. And I would take the history of mathematics as seen by India and show pictures of the mathematics of India. The Taj Mahal, decimal places. Uh, Ramanujan, some of the great mathematicians. And instead of putting on little posters, small size, each concept was two posters. And I decided at my college to take a wall 40 feet and show you the mathematics of India. Oh, but I'm not Indian, Native American. I did a wall of mathematics of the Native American. African American and Africa, a wall of mathematics. Italy and the Renaissance, the Middle and Near East, Woman of mathematics, where I showed woman of mathematics and I kept it clean, make sure there was no, you know, <laughs> something like that. So I would show them some of the ideas, or if I had to give a talk about mathematics, I would run the talk by her, or if I wrote a poem, I says, How does it sound? And she would give the feedback, you know. And she said, Okay, that's good. I think you should make it shorter. I think you should say this and that. It's all right, I look at it, study. That way, learning goes on to a degree. So, as a teacher, I'd show a problem. And if a student says, why couldn't we do it this way? Take a few minutes, think. Okay, let's look at it this way. And then we're building, and before you know it, you're learning to a certain degree. Now, we're just about, oh, here we go. We'll let this, we'll, we'll pass this around. In 1995, maybe before some of us were born, I'm not, you know, whatever. Okay, 1995, I wrote a classic work for the NFL Hall of Fame. The Bronx, Blacks, and the NFL. Where I do the history of the Bronx and the Blacks and the NFL. I do the classic work. I wrote it up first. This year, before the Super Bowl, and the Super Bowl had two African-American quarterbacks, okay? Before they had the two quarterbacks, I was thinking of this day, I said, you know what? I wrote this, let me collage it. Originally, I was gonna do it this way, one, two, three, four, but I said, ah. So then I thought, I said, let me go a little bit of a different style. The same thing. So I put it together. Now, what was funny is that the Super Bowl appeared, and there's a lot of Bronx connections to the Super Bowl, etc. And as I put this together, I realized something after the Super Bowl. Well, most people do not know this name, this person. But, as I explained to Dr. Payne before, his name is Fritz Pollard. They recently, he recently was uh, elected to the NFL Hall of Fame. Okay? First African-American quarterback. First African-American coach. Okay. Now, we'll just go aside to A friend of mine, Bob Carroll, NFL Hall of Fame, Canton, Ohio, he works for, and the Pro Football Research Association, wrote about Fritz Pollard and started a program, which I was part of, where we're going to get Fritz Pollard into the NFL Hall of Fame, way back when. Okay? Bob Carroll also wrote about me for the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and I was the first non-NFL person that they wrote about, Vic Masher of the Bronx. And like I was telling uh, Vivian and Helen a little bit, that I had proposed an idea way back in the early 80s. 
I said, I want to write about the Bronx in the NFL. And they laughed at me. What are you stupid? There's nothing there. You got nothing. What college is there? What, 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 one game, two games. So I did the research. And I opened up. It was like they were amazed. And this is the baby. And they still consider it the number one game of all time. The December 28th game. So he wrote about me. He gets into the Hall of Fame, etc. Now, part of his story, two places. The Dykeman Oval is no longer around over in Washington Heights. Years ago in the 30s, early 30s, people thought the Dykeman Oval was in the Bronx because it was right over the water. Okay? Then McCombs Dam Park. We know where that is, right? Okay. So what happens? Fritz Pollard is part of a black professional football league in the 30s. A lot of it's based out of Hall. Harlem is right across the river. Fritz Pollard is the coach of this team. Joe Lewis is the fighter. He's nicknamed the Brown Bomber. So the first team that they, he names is the New York Brown Bombers in tribute to Joe Lewis or the Brown Bombers. Everybody with us? Yes? And the next team that appears is the New York Black Yankees football team because there was a baseball team earlier, but that's baseball. So I decided to do a little bit of the history and I had trouble which way to go. So I decided I put Joe Lewis, nicknamed this, same time period, Fritz Pollard, put him on top, even though I think he had quite a bit to do to, for civil rights, Joe Lewis, before Jackie Robinson. Yeah. And I put Jackie Robinson, there's some football tales to him, but his impact on baseball and impact on all sports. Now, from my readings, there were the first four African-American football players in the All-American Football Conference, Commissioner Jim Crowley, Fordham, Four Horsemen, Eleanor Garrick, Lou Garrick's wife, she lived, and the, the headquarters for the AAFC was the Grand Concourse, the Concourse Hotel, the Concourse Plaza. Yeah. So, the four people, 1946, Kenny Washington, not really a Bronx connection. He played with the Los Angeles Rams, even though they were named after the 37, 36 Fordham Rams that we talked about, the Los Angeles Rams. Kenny Washington, Woody Strode, an old time actor. He, uh, common role, he played a lot of cowboy flicks and in Spartacus, he was the one that had the trident, the pitchfork like, you know, the devil's fork in Spartacus's neck. Tall guy, Woody Strode. The other big name was Jim Brown. I got into an argument on the radio station WFUV, God knows how many years ago, maybe 25 years ago. And they said the greatest football player was Jim Brown. And I said, I agree, but I disagree. Who are you going to pick? And I said, I'm going to pick Sammy Bohr. Who's he? Well, in the 1930s and into the 40s, he was a great quarterback. He led the league in passing, throwing touchdown passes. Really a great quarterback. Also, he had punting records and kicking records. And besides that, he held a record for most interceptions in a year. He was a three-way player, Sammy Bohr. Oh, but Jim Brown. I said, Jim Brown is great. But this guy was very, so I give Sam Ball, even though I feel James Brown was the greatest football player, the other one was all around, because James Brown, Jim Brown, no offense, couldn't really block, didn't really play defense. And later on, as you start to catch passes, 
So, but Jim Brown, not from the Bronx or Yankee Stadium, but every time that Jim Brown played in Yankee Stadium from 1957 to 1963, just about, forget about it, 58 to 63, he couldn't run. He had his worst games of his career at Yankee Stadium. It was a jinx. Yankee Stadium was a jinx to Jim Brown, the greatest. Okay? I think the Giants, let's say, 58. They won three games against the Browns. 59, they won two. I think they won seven, eight games against the dominating Cleveland Browns in a row. And Jim Brown couldn't run. So I put the cards together. Buddy Young. Uh, my friend Richie that we mentioned, we mentioned the Richie. He used to work with Buddy Young at Dewood Clinton. Yeah, he and said he, he went to Dewood Clinton. He said he graduated from Dewood Yeah, Clinton. Richie, yes. And Buddy Young was a working scholarships for minority students with Richie, because I remember we were talking about Buddy Young. Richie didn't know Buddy Young. He was working with but I knew about his history. Buddy Young. Then there was this, his name is Wilmot Singh. S-I-N-G-H. It's an Indian name. I have an empty African Americans. The, da the father was a doctor dentist and he married a woman who had a son. And he got his name, Wilmot Singh, S-I-N-G-H. Superstar at Clinton, and then he played for Syracuse. He might have been the greatest athlete in Syracuse history next to Jim Brown. Maybe, give or take. Okay? Joined the Tuskegee Airmen during World War II on a training flight. The plane went into like one of the uh, Great Lakes and the parachute wind up drowning him. Mm. Sad story. But he did have a tremendous college career. He was a quarterback. Wilmot Singh, Dewitt Clinton. Over here, come up to my days and we'll go over here. And then we'll pass this around. His name is Calvin Hill. Dallas Cowboys, Washington Redskins. He went to Riverdale Prep. And from Riverdale Prep, he went to Yale. I did not play against him, but I was on the field the way he played against my team. He beat us all by himself. I didn't even play. I wanted to play. I said, yeah, I'll tackle him. And uh, meanwhile, we couldn't tackle him. He was like invincible. I didn't get to play, but he played against us. He shut us out. He beat us. Okay, Calvin Hill, Riverdale Prep. And then I, he had a son who played a little basketball. I don't know the name. Grant Hill. I don't know the, yeah. Grant Hill played a little basketball. That was his son. Grant Hill was a pretty good player, right? Great player. Great college player. His father? Okay. See, I, I, I didn't know about his son. I knew about him. He's a little bit older than me. Maybe Calvin is maybe two years older than me. Give or take. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Now, the other person that I, I throw in, Gail Sayers. He did a little, he broke a rookie rushing record at Yankee Stadium. That's a minor point. But I put him in anyway, Gail Sayers. But the real reason why I put Gail Sayers in, because I think the year was, I think 71, it could be off. They made a movie called Brian Song, which was the story of Gail Sayers and how uh, Johnny Musso, I think, the other Chicago Bear running back helped Gail Sayers to become the great Gail Sayers, Brian Song. And in that picture, James Cohn, who passed away what, last James year or so, Cohen, yeah. James Cohn played the football player. Right, right. And James Cohn is from the Bronx. There you go. <laughs> so I tied it together that way. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Because I did. Oh, he James Cohn, I saw the one. He was in The Godfather. The Godfather, Sonny. Yeah. And uh, James Conn, so, you know, I put him in to tell the story, you know, 
I didn't create James Conn. Got to be born in the Bronx so you can put into the story. <laughs> so, you know, I read and I take notes. Uh, yesterday I was at a military thing. I took notes. Now I got to go home and see how I can use them. I've always been taking notes. I got, I got a lot of paper which I'm condensing, as you can see, into the things. All right.